Good morning, everybody. How are you today? Good? Awesome. I hear awesome over here. I just want to wish you a great welcome from Church Unlimited White River. Again, as Leon said, my name is Brenda, and my husband Craig is one of the elders here at CU White River who will actually be preaching this morning. Just want to give a special welcome. Do we have any first-time visitors today? Any first-time visitors? Right over here. Oh, a couple right here. Over here. Keep your hands up. We have a little something for you. Thank you. Keep your hands up. Did we get everybody? Welcome. You're most welcome this morning. Please come to the back of church in the welcome area after the service. We'd love to meet you and get to know you, and you can get to know us a little bit as well. Thank you. And just a couple announcements today. So I have a question. Who here has had a breakfast bun ever between first and second service? Raise your hand. They're really nice, especially if you haven't had a chance to eat breakfast before first service, which I never eat breakfast before I come to church. I don't know why. But just so you know, so the Band of Brothers, which is our um, a men's only small group that we have here at CU White River, they're the ones who have said, yes, we are going to help make these breakfast buns, and they've committed to three months. So that three months is coming to an end. And so we don't want to... Um, bur bur make them be worn out from this. So we're putting a little request out there. If there's anyone else who'd like to say, we'll take the baton from here, and maybe we'll commit for three months to do something by way of food. It doesn't have to be breakfast buns. Maybe the Lord has given you a special family recipe you want to share with us between services. Please come see one of us after the service. We'd love to talk about how you can use your little gift to feed some tummies between the services. Okay, and then, oh, no, we're not going to do that one. Okay, and then the last announcement from my side is next week is our triple Sunday. We try to do this about once a month to make sure everyone has an opportunity and they can't say, I don't know when that was and, and I forgot and that day passed me by. So what triple Sunday is, is it's an opportunity to step a little bit more into um, your faith, step into a little bit, engage with the church a little bit more. So there's three things. Number one, if you have a little one that you, have, that you would like to raise in the ways of the Lord, baby dedication is what we do for that here at Church Unlimited White River. We believe that a parent can come to the front of the church and say, please, this is my body of the body of Christ that the Lord has put me in here at Church Unlimited White River. Won't you help me raise this little one in the ways of the Lord? And you dedicate that baby to the Lord. Also, so we're going to do that at our first service next week. So that's the first thing. The second thing is baptisms. If you are an adult and you've said, yes, Jesus is my Lord and Savior, but you've not yet been baptized and gone under the waters, next week we have an opportunity for that. We'll do that between first and second service. And then finally, if you've been coming to see you, maybe today's your first time or maybe you've been coming for a bit, and in your heart you say, this is your home. Or maybe you say, I want to maybe make this my home, but how will I know? We have a looking in meeting next Sunday at 12 o'clock at Leon and Nicole's home, which is just down the road in Waterbury Estates. And there will be an opportunity to learn more about Church Unlimited White River, how to get more involved. If you have questions about what we believe or how we do life as a body, we would invite you to that. And that's an opportunity for you to say, you know what, yes, this is my church, and, and to let the, let the leadership know that you want to call Church Unlimited White River your home. That is all from my side, but we have a video for a couple other announcements. Thank you. Morning, everyone. My name is Chris, and I'm here just to give a quick notice about the Church Family Fun Day on Sunday the 25th of September, so in two weeks' time. Uh, this, uh, this time it's going to be at Uplands Prep and it's going to be a, uh, in the form of a friendly but competitive game of cricket. Uh, so if you're kind of over the age of 15 or know what a bat and a ball is, you're welcome to play. 
Uh, and for those who don't want to play but just come, want to come and watch, we're going to have a braai going. There's going to be a lot of people around. It's just going to be a lot of fun for everyone. So Sunday the 25th at Uplands Prep for a friendly but competitive game of cricket or just the braai. Hope to see you there. Hey church, how are you guys doing? I just want to bring two quick announcements to your attention. Really important and exciting dates that are coming up. The first is the 24th of September. We have a team coming from Scottborough, friends of ours who lead a church there, Stuart Kilmartin, um, and he'll be bringing a team. We're having what we call an Encountering God. We've had a few of those over the last few months, uh, an Encountering God evening from 6 p.m. onwards. And they've just been phenomenal, what God has done in those nights. Um, so come along, bring a friend, uh, you'll enjoy it. And then 6th and 7th of October are the other two dates that I want to bring to your attention. We're having what we call the Low Felt Equip. It's going to be hosted at Church Unlimited in Bombella. And um, it'll just be the evenings, the two evenings, the 6th and the 7th. So you won't even have to take leave for that. We've got guys coming from out of, literally out of the country, from Europe um, and from where else? Zimbabwe, as well as some local guys. So uh, those, are, those are dates that you don't want to miss. Have an awesome meeting. Eh? Cheers. For those that don't know me, I think there was a few new people here. My name is Craig Rebro. I'm one of the elders here at Church Unlimited White River. And it's so nice to see you here this morning. So did you see the guy on the screen, um, Chris Paulson? He had a very English accent. We were with him last night with a group of people. And he does, they both do a great job at bringing events and things like that to the church. And we were talking, and because his accent, he leaves the R's out of a lot of thing, things. He said, we're going to play, or we're, we're going to have a gathering or an event where it's just for the men for dance. Dogs. <laughs> and we thought he said it was going to be a men's only event that was going to be a dance. And we thought, is he nuts? We're going to have a men's only dance at the Church Unlimited White Tour. But he said darts. Well, there's an R in that word. So anyway, we really thank them for their, their uh, yeah, the, their serving at the church and what they do for us. Okay. Anyway, my name is Craig Rebro, I'm married to Brenda, will be for 25 years next month. <laughs> and it's such a blessing to be here today. And I, my message today, I've, I've titled it, The Case for Context. And if there was a subtitle, I would call it Challenging Our Belief Systems. And I think the Lord gave me a pretty challenging message for you today today. Um, and so I'm going to pray, but I want to tell you why I know he wants me to give you this message, because every time I sat down, there was a distraction. My, my fence alarm was going off, uh, my internet Wi-Fi wouldn't work, I had a flat tire, we had no water, so I'm convinced this message is for you guys, because I don't think the enemy wants me to give it to you, even if it's challenging. So let me open in prayer. Father God, thank you so much that you reveal truths to us. You give us the words that you want us to say to one another. I just pray that this message doesn't come from my flesh, but rather from my spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. So it's September 11th, and on this day in history, uh, it has significant meaning from where I'm from. And when I think of 9-11 or September 11th, this is what I think of. Yeah, t 21 years ago this day, Brent and I were traveling to Chicago for a, a business meeting. On the way, we heard the radio reports that planes were crashing into the Twin Towers in New York and into the Pentagon in Washington, D.C., and no one knew the extent of the attacks or if they would continue. But the United States was under attack on American soil, and it seemed like the world came to a standstill for a moment. And I remember as we were getting close to Chicago, we saw airplanes overhead coming into O'Hare Airport, and we were listening on the news, on the radio, of all these attacks going on. And it was, it was an eerie feeling as we're seeing planes try to find a place to land, not knowing if, they, if Chicago was a target. Um, it is a major city in the U.S., so it very well could have been a target. 
And we made the decision to turn around and go to be with our kids. At that time, um, Sydney was, was eight months, and my oldest boy, Alec, was two and a half years. And so we turned around and we went home. And it was a tragic day in history. Almost 3,000 people were killed and over 6,000 were injured. And unfortunately, the events of 9-11 caused many Americans to develop a certain mindset about Muslims. Fourteen years later, I was a passenger in a car here in South Africa. I was with Brenda and our, a young Australian friend who was driving. We were driving through Masoy, uh, one of the communities close to here, and a bucky pulled out in front of us. She froze, and my imaginary brake didn't work, and so we hit him. And then we were stuck there at a busy roundabout. A crowd ensued. We weren't quite sure what was going to happen. And one wonderful African lady came and helped us by standing guard. Uh, she sort of shooed people away. And while I was assessing the damage and changing the tire, a Muslim man came urgently running out of his shop. Uh, he was wearing the traditional thobe, or like the long robe that is common to a Muslim man. And I just remember in the middle of the chaos being more concerned about this man than anything else. But God was dealing with me in that situation. Not only was this man not my enemy, he was there to protect me. And in fact, he was the kindest person I could have ever met. This gentle man stood faithfully next to me as I was changing the tire and there was all this chaos. And as we were about to leave, he humbly asked me in this soft voice, he, he said, can I have permission to go back to my shop? <laughs> Yo, God highlighted a blind spot for me. I didn't even know I had a prejudice like that until he pointed it out in a mighty way. He showed me that my, my thinking was wrong about a people group that I unintentionally had judgment about somewhere deep in my thinking. And I use this example because I know historical events and even the way we were brought up can shape the way we think, even if we don't mean to. And I'm telling you this because context is critical in our lives. My belief system was not accurate to assume most Muslims were terrorists or wanting to do me harm. The context in which I understood Muslim people was extremely flawed. I would say that I was taking a Muslim person totally out of context for who they were. And that can get us into trouble. Someone once said that you can't take a thimble full of knowledge and make a bucket full of judgment. And that statement is a good lead-in for today's message. So I want to read you the definition of context to provide some clarity. It should be on the screen. And it's the circumstances that form the setting for an event, statement, or idea in terms of which it can be fully understood. I'm going to read it again because I struggled with it when I first read it. The circumstances that form the setting for an event, statement, or idea in terms of which it can be fully understood. And I'm going to unpack this idea of taking things out of context to show you why it's good to challenge our belief systems at times. Maybe even to do a little self-reflection related to how we understand things or how we engage with others. And there's four main points that we'll examine today. It'll be people groups, which I've highlighted in my intro. It'll be individuals, biblical context, and churches and church leaders. And so for me, there's been a few preaches over the years that have really stuck with me. And I often sprinkle these concepts into my messages, which I will also do today. And those headlines for those preaches are, number one, first of all, pray. It's 100% grace, 100% truth. Don't forget joy in obedience. Dig your own wells. And this one, which I'll paraphrase. What if everyone is doing their best? And this is where I'll tie in point number two of how we think about individuals. And just to summarize point one, that's what we'll do at the end, which is people groups. But, so for note takers, I know you go 
in, in order. So number one is people groups. Number two is individuals, which we'll get to right now. Can you imagine if we lived in a world where our initial assumptions about every person was that they're doing their best rather than immediately judging a person or situation from our point of view? How would that change things? I would suggest that it would make a huge difference in our relationships, our demeanor, our attitudes, and our actions towards others. How often do we get irritated or frustrated with someone because they don't fit our context or our belief system? When we get frustrated or irritated, I would argue that we may have taken that person or situation out of context or out of their context. And we often don't have enough information to fully understand a situation, but yet we're quick to put our judgment on it. Or is it just me? Something very helpful to me to remember is everyone has a story. If you don't know that story, how can you judge? In fact, it's God's role to judge, not ours. Our role is to show forgiveness and compassion. And how does Jesus view us? I think he views us as we are doing our best. And when we aren't, the Holy Spirit nudges us back to where we need to be. And that's why we feel uncomfortable when we sin. Jesus sees future potential in us of who we were created to be, not what we've done wrong. Let's be like Jesus. My third point is biblical context. So let's examine Scripture in John chapter 8, verse 3 through 11. I'll just give you a moment to get there, and I'm in the NIV. If you don't have your Bibles, it should be on the screen. Okay, looks like most people are either technology people or reading the screen. So I'll read it. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such a woman. Now what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, Let any of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time, the older ones first, until only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. So let's investigate this context in this passage. On the surface, you might think that this passage is simply to teach us that adultery is sin. It is, but if we look deeper, this was more about the Jewish leaders being angry about their failed plans to arrest Jesus the night before, or the day before. In the chapter before, temple guards were sent by the chief priests to arrest Jesus. The guards were so overcome by Jesus, they did not lay hands on him. And then they went away. They said, no one has ever spoke this way. The Pharisees replied, you mean he has also deceived you? Have any one of the rulers or Pharisees believed in him? No. But this wasn't the case because Nicodemus did believe. Five chapters earlier, Nicodemus visited Jesus at, in the night and asked him questions. He left a changed man and was, was one of the few religious leaders who believed in Jesus. Although Nicodemus was an undercover believer, he stood up for justice regarding Jesus in chapter 7, verse 50, which I'll get to in a minute. All of this created a huge huge irritation for the Jewish leaders. They saw themselves as the elite group, the only ones that had the truth. And so their self-centered attitude did not allow them to agree with someone who challenged their power and authority. They were losing ground. The temple guards were impressed by Jesus, and Nicodemus was even defending him. When their prestige started disappearing, their pride got in the way of reason. 
They became obsessed with getting rid of Jesus, and what was right no longer mattered. In that passage that I read, the Pharisees started this process of trying to trap Jesus by accusing the woman but disregarding their own law. You see, the law required that both parties to adultery be tried or stoned. So their hypocritical motives were on full display. If I had to guess, I don't think they cared at all about the woman. She was simply being used to try and trick Jesus into saying the wrong thing. But Jesus used the entire situation to call out sin, to forgive, to rebuke, and to even invite the Pharisees into repentance. They weren't as clever as Jesus, and it drove them crazy. When you have context, doesn't it give life to the Scriptures? As we dug into the passage, it highlights the power and the authority of Jesus. Can you almost feel the Jewish leaders seething as they lose their grip on power? So even though this passage is titled, Jesus Forgives an Adulterous Woman, there is so much more going on here. And it's the same with people and in their lives. There's often so much going on behind the scenes. It's context that we lack at times, which leaves out the richness of a situation to be able to fully understand. So dig deeper to mine the riches. One last point as it relates to context in the Bible. There's been many instances when people quote things out of context. When it's done using scripture, it can be very damaging. And one of the most controversial scriptures in the Bible is 1 Timothy 2, 12. It says, I do not permit a woman to teach or to assume authority over a man. She must be quiet. If we read Paul's words out of context, this can be very off-putting. But in context, this was not for all churches for all time. It was for a particular time in history speaking to Ephesian women who were new converts. They weren't prepared or mature enough to teach yet. They must be quiet was not because they were noisy women, but because culturally men would learn in quietness and submission. And so he was simply inviting them to learn in the proper manner. If we examine scripture, Paul does not forgive, forbid women from teaching. He even commends Priscilla for doing so. How about these two scriptures? Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife. Or what about, wives should submit in everything to their husbands. I'm getting glares, I think. <laughs> Both of these scriptures are in Ephesians 5, but those of you that know your Bible would recognize I did not quote the full verse. The first one is part of verse 22, and the second is part of verse 24. But this is the danger in taking only pieces of scripture or taking something out of context. The scriptures above are immediately followed by husbands are told to love their wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. So what that means is husbands, you need to be willing to die for your wives. If the husband is doing what scripture says, the wife will, will want to submit to her husband because he is serving her in such an amazing way. Many people miss that because of lack of context. The Bible even cautions us about misrepresenting scripture in Deuteronomy 4, verse 2. Scripture says, do not add to what I command you and do not subtract from it, but keep the commands of the Lord your God that I give you. And it gets even more serious in Revelation 22, 18, and 19. It reads, I warn every one of you who hears the words of the prophecy of this scroll, if anyone adds anything to them, God will add to that person the plagues described in the scroll. If anyone takes words away from the scroll of prophecy, God will take away from that person any share in the tree of life and in the holy city which are described in this scroll. So it's clear we're not to take away we're not to, and we're not to leave out anything having to do with Scripture. So point number four, churches and church leaders. I'm going to go to Matthew 7 
verse 1 through 5. Some of you might be familiar with it. Judge not that you be not judged. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use it, will be measured to you. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to a brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there is a log in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. For me, the scariest part of this scripture is in verse 2. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. I'm actually thankful for this scripture as it helps us to stay grounded. As it relates to context, let's remember to carry a little mirror around with us that when we start to feel like we need to judge someone, we can see the log in our own eye. So why did I choose this scripture to talk about the church and church leaders? As I was preparing for today, I was deeply challenged by this question. But what about false teachers? Aren't we supposed to call them out? And I'll get to that in a minute. I'm not sure if it's just me, but the internet can be a scary place. It can suck your time away on nonsense, and it can shape our thinking in a negative way if we're not careful. What concerns me is Christians who are creating division in the faith by posting negativity about other Christians without context. Often these things are forwarded from someone else. I've heard it described as heresy hunters or truth declarers. And it's very dangerous to broad stroke a church or a church leader into a category. I know people that don't have quiet time or read their Bible regularly and they're critical of those leading churches. So much so, they post divisive things on social media. And this is so damaging to the lost. Why would anybody want to be a Christian if all we do is attack one another and prove each other wrong? And this is where context comes in. Remember back in John, I mentioned Nicodemus. It's in John 7, 50, 51. John chapter 7, verse 50 and 51. It says, Nicodemus, who had gone to Jesus earlier and who was one of their own number, asked, Does our law condemn a man without first hearing him to find out what he has been doing? So there's two main important points here. Nicodemus had gone to Jesus. And secondly, he wanted to find out from him firsthand. So I did some research on one of the popular Christian movements and well-known churches. I shared this with my small group on Tuesday that I was getting very frustrated. I found myself defending things that had nothing to do with my context here in White River. I ended up spending close to two hours reading opinions about a church and a church leader that's not even within a 20-hour flight of here. I've never been there myself. And I found people were singing praise of this church and church leader, and others were saying they were the worst thing in the world. So I came to a few personal convictions. What you look for, you'll find. If you look for the bad, you'll find the bad. And if you look for the good, you'll find that too. Point two is the destruction of gossip and distant assumption leaves no room for questions. Distant assumption. Are we getting involved in things that aren't relevant to us? And what is your heart's position? My heart must be positioned to help correct for the good of others, not to prove a point. And number four, I must be prayerful if I choose to engage in correction of someone else. And if I am, if I do correct them, will it glorify Jesus or not? Guys, if we get a bee in our bonnet about a church or a church leader, I would take it to scripture. Matthew 18, 15 talks about this. If your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault just between the two of you. And this is where I have a problem with being critical by distant assumption. Nicodemus said it. Do we condemn someone without first hearing him or her? 
And Matthew clearly states this. Point out their fault just between the two of you. And this is where our hearts tested. Are we willing to meet a person face to face to hear him or her about the problem we have? Once we get to this place, we quickly realize that we often don't have enough context to pass judgment or to correct someone or we realize maybe it's just not my place. As a rule, we should allow the elders of the church to respond to heresy. And if, we're call, if we are to call out false teachers or false do- doctrine, it must be done with the right heart in the right context. For us personally, it is wise to examine the scriptures, as the Bereans did to confirm the truth. They did it with an open mind and with eagerness, not to convict someone or to prove a point. But we must not hunt for heresy. So in conclusion, the case for context and challenging our belief system has far-reaching implications on our lives. Let me break down the different areas that we talked about today. People groups. Do we put certain people groups in a box? God dealt with me personally about this one. Find your blind spots. If you use language like those people, take a deeper dive into what that actually means when you say it. Number two is individuals. Let's remember that everyone has a story. When we don't take the time to get to know someone, it's easy to pass judgment because we're doing so through our own context, not theirs. I've probably been most ashamed when I personally judge someone before understanding their situation. Adopt the philosophy that everyone is doing their best. And how about biblical context? There's a part A and B to this one. Don't fall into the trap of reading scripture out of context. Or even worse, quoting scripture out of context to make a point. That's very dangerous, as we described above. And point B, have you developed the ability to dig your own wells and get your own revelation? Or do we rely only on the Sunday message or podcast from someone else? I want to encourage you that the Bible is rich with depth and wisdom. If you haven't discovered that yet, let your life be changed by these truths in greater context. Don't ride on the coattails of someone else's relationship with Jesus. Have your own vibrant and personal one. And then point four, the churches and church leaders. Examine your heart. Is the purpose of engaging with another church or criticizing a church leader going to unite or divide? Consider what Matthew 18 and 15 says about pointing out someone's fault. It's just between the two of you to start. And beware of being critical by distant assumption. Remember, assumptions leave out context, especially from faraway places. So I hope today was thought-provoking. 